Welcome everybody to this uh, second discussion, second panel within the focus uh, on uh, Ukraine. Um, yesterday's discussion uh, was on decolonializing the media, how to decolonialize the media. Today's discussion will focus on the question Westernization and Eastern European cinema. And maybe less for you, the audience, but more for us participants. Uh, I will just reread the capture of today's uh, focus so you all remember uh, what is the big question behind it, because we will have many small questions. So the second discussion will focus on how Eastern European cinema fits into global cinema. What are the tendencies of soft? Western colonialism in film festival structures and do Eastern European filmmakers consciously or unconsciously adapt their cinematic works to Western European audiences? How difficult is it for people from smaller countries working in the film industry to fit into festival structures and topographies? And what is the hegemony of A-list festivals or the role of superiority? So these are the bigger questions. And let me introduce shortly to you, the audience, uh, the participants of the panel, starting from your left with Lawrence Boyce, UK-born, Leeds-born, <laughs> cultural journalist, film critic and programmer, who has been based in Estonia 
for more than 10 years now, where he has worked as a curator at the Tallinn Black Knight Film Festival, for example, but also uh, f uh, working on the festival's short film section, uh, the Puff Shorts. He regularly contributes to the Baltic Sea region, film publications, Screen International and Cine Europa, and is a member of Fibrischki, London Critics Association and the European Film Academy, and BAFTA. Next uh, to Lawrence, um, you have a Latvian filmmaker, also participant of this year's uh, international competition of the festival, Matthias Kaja, who was born in Sweden but raised in Latvia and holds a BA in film and television production from the New York University uh, Tisch School of the Arts. He's one of the most prolific filmmakers, even at a very young age. Uh, so he's uh, maybe the most uh, uh, spotlighted, I would say at least this year, uh, filmmaker from the new generation of Latvian cinema. And he works both as a director and a producer. And today I think he will share his experience from both these uh, um, uh, professional backgrounds, being a director and a producer. Next to Matisse, we have uh, Marcin Pienkowski uh, from Poland, uh, who is a film marketing and communication expert, a lecturer, a film historian, an editor, and the co-author of many books. But uh, his main profession at the moment, uh, but is also subdivided in, uh, in different uh, tasks, is being the director of uh, the biggest and maybe one of the most important uh, festivals in Poland, the New Horizon International Film Festival, Nowe Horizonty in Wrocław, uh, where he has worked many, many years. And for two years now, he, he moved from artistic directory to uh, being the director of uh, this whole uh, festival. And it not only includes um, running the festival, but is also associated with it um, a distribution company named uh, New Horizon Association. So Marcin will share his experience from the point of view of a fest film festival maker, but also a distributor. And last but not least, uh, Aniko Imre, who hopefully some of you have already heard because uh, only yesterday she gave a lecture with a complicated title, but it was something I was reminded of semi-peripheral media industries. And it's really great that uh, today we will have the uh, opportunity to maybe relate a little bit back to this lecture, but also um, relate to uh, Aniko's uh, vast background as an resp internationally respected scholar in the field of uh, film theory and media industry uh, theory. Uh, she's the author of several monographs, uh, maybe the two most important ones, or the one to highlight, is Eastern European Cinemas from 2005 and Post-Socialist Identities from 2009. But continuously she's uh, working um, on the questions of post-socialism, media, and European cultural space. Uh, many theoretical sub-questions uh, linked to this uh, problem. I would say uh, she's outstanding in the way she connects uh, a very detailed observation of industry processes with uh, ideological questions. Uh, so, of course, post-colonialism and westernization and capitalization are uh, main focuses of um, uh, her approach. My name is Barbara Wurm. I uh, am Austrian-born but live in Germany for a long time. I work in two fields in academics on the one hand. At Humboldt University I studied Russian and I'm a Slavic scholar and I teach uh, Eastern European film uh, at Humboldt University and also I work as a programmer and curator for film festivals. I used to work for a long time for Doc Leipzig uh, and then moved on to Go East in Wiesbaden Germany and now I work for Berlinale in the selection team. So we have a very broad uh, uh, variety of or representatives of, of different fields and maybe to start uh, or to try to link uh, this question um, and to give you the opportunity to kind of tackle the cinema, uh, the term of cinema maybe from your professional backgrounds in the world we live in and with the problems sketched out shortly um, 
what would you say uh, um, from your point of view uh, about this uh, observation that our curator Darta has made, namely cinema as a as a weapon in in at times of war, but at times uh, where um, we consider ourselves still uh, not at war, but as cultural playground. And um, yeah, what is the relation of cinema and um, and this question of power struggle uh, for you? Lawrence, maybe do you want to start? Films are stories. Films are stories that are meant to tell us about something. And audiences go to cinema to experience these stories and different points of view. And I think they're incredibly powerful as weapons, if you want to call it that, because it is about seeing different points of view and understanding parts of the world you don't necessarily know about. That's what cinema has always been. It's about the idea of going somewhere and seeing something that you don't know about to learn. It's, I know it sounds very simplistic, but I do think that is a basic heart of it that there are people from across the world who want to experience what other people are thinking and are doing, and cinema is a, a medium of doing that. And within that, that is also an importance of film festivals, because when f festivals do their job right, they are trying to get audiences to see films that they don't necessarily get a chance to see. And within that, you are trying to get audiences to enjoy themselves, but to delve deeper into a world of cinema, to enjoy the art of cinema, but within that, see different voices, see and experience different points of view. And again, I know it sounds a very, very basic level, but I think that is, for me, an important level. I work with short films a lot, and short films are, again, seeing different people from across the world with something that they want to talk about. And within that, it's this idea that n people aren't necessarily a stranger anymore. That through fiction, through documentary, through animation, through shorts, you see people's ideas and get to understand. Again, I think a basic and simple idea, but I, I think it is a truth. So you would say, despite the fact that we're always talking about different regions, uh, even languages and nations, uh, there is something like this utopian uh, beginning point of cinema as a, as a language I of its own? I, I do believe that there is that utopian idea, and I do think at least the utopian idea of festivals as well within that, that, that we do what we want to do, whether we are successful in that is probably a question for later on, is that we want people to experience something that they can latch upon to. And again, that they haven't experienced before, because if you look at the world of cinema and look at the world of mainstream cinema, only so much gets released. Only so much is given to a general audience. A festival's job is trying to find those films that people don't necessarily get to experience. And within that, different subject matters, sometimes more difficult subject matters, films from places that they might not normally get to see a film from. I mean, it's uh, maybe symptomatic that uh, apart from one member of the panel, we all come from uh, not just different backgrounds, but from backgrounds where we have moved away from and moved to other contexts and lived in other contexts. So we are kind of re -re also represent some kind of hybrid <laughs> uh, identity background. And, and when you point out the educational value, it also means that you have experienced this coming as a uh, as a UK journalist, maybe to the to this it's other part of the. It, it's continent. true. I mean, I, I, I want to make a quick caveat mm -hmm. because I, I want to say that I moved to Estonia in 2009 because on the jury of Black Knights and I met my partner, and then I decided to move to the Estonia the next year. And then I went to Black Knights and said, I'm moving, do you have any jobs? And they said yes, which is very nice. <laughs> now that's not just a cute story, but there's a difference in dynamic as well, because it wasn't me going there to say, I am moving there to have a job, because there is a different dynamic if they had gone to me, we want you to come over, or I have made a thing, I want to find a job at a film, film festival somewhere else. The dynamic was slightly different. And within that, I've now been there for 12 years. And throughout that 12 years, how my relationship to cinema in general, to the cinema of the country that I now live in, and how I react to the audiences that I program for has changed a lot. And I'm sure we're going to get onto this later mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. that how I approach things 
and even I know we talked about cultural journalism yesterday, but you know I write about films from Estonia, from Latvia, from Lithuania and other places, and how I do that and how I approach that has changed mm -hmm. dramatically. Mm -hmm. Also, just a very quick point as well. I just do want to say that everything I will talk about later on is through the prism of my personal experience. <laughs> and it will be from me and not necessarily representative of Black Knight subsidiaries therein in the management, just so we're all clear. That's always a problem. Yes. Matis has less problem in being a representative uh, <laughs> because he represents his own <laughs> work, yeah? Matis, also uh, from several backgrounds, uh, from your point of view. Yeah, well, <coughs> I think it's uh, it's what you said about storytelling and that it is telling this diversity of stories, but it's also how these stories are told, which is important. Because as a filmmaker, I know that the same, um, the same story can be told in several different ways, and you only have to change the camera angle, and it's a different point of view on that character or on that situation. And um, I think that's something uh, to realize, especially at a time of war in Europe, that it's, only not, it's not only about you know, uh, the fable, it's also about the inter interpretation of the fable and how things are positioned. And when it comes to distribution and when it comes to festival circuits, we need to think about, um, let's say, the consequences of being apolitical, what that means. Because I think it's, it puts... Um, it puts you in a very peculiar position in a time like this to be apolitical for, for example, for a distribution platform or for a festival to say, oh, no, we're we have nothing to do with this. Because, of course, you have everything to do with this. You can't just isolate yourself in some sort of imagined utopia for two weeks of a festival just because you say so. Um, so that's something that I want to make clear from my point of view, that um, no matter if you imagine yourself in some sort of vacuum, there is this outside world that you're very clearly linked to, and that's something that, on, on, as a producer and as somebody who works with distributors, that I keep in mind. Can I just ask a like, specification of the, of the term apolitical? Where would you say starts the apoliticalness of... Uh, well, it, it, it starts with uh, the vernacular that certain film institutions or festivals say that, or state that um, our programming, for example, in this year is not in any way influenced by the current ongoing political events and so on and so forth. So that's how I, I see as, as them stating, as, uh, stating themselves as being apolitical. Well, that, but that's just my point of view. No, it's very important yeah. because one is the is the story as such, the uh, utopia of the language, and then the al already perspective that you make a film or suggest a film, submit a film, expect to be a, a film to be somewhere within the frame of uh, of this political non-political, which I think is. Um, but then the selection is probably the most, at, the, at this point <laughs> of film festival uh, industry, I think the selection as such and the question which you denied for yourself, which I would also always deny for myself, but it is there, the question of re being a representative of some film culture, of some country, <laughs> of some, especially at the situation where it is clear that we have a, <laughs> a crime state and a <laughs> and an aggressor and uh, and the state which is uh, chosen by this aggressor to become the the play playground of of uh, this uh, hegemony or colonial um, uh, relationship so moving on to uh, to margin this gives us the chance maybe also to uh, look at it from the perspective again from film the film festivals maybe also distribution yeah. mm, so uh, the selection of the festival, it's a, it's a statement, but also not uh, films are which are not selected, it's also, you know, it's a statement. Uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a kind of a paradox because, you know, I, I represent a festival devoted to very arty, um, edgy, uh, radical, experimental cinema. Mm, uh, but, you know, it's, um, I think the most important film, I, I had a thought this morning uh, walking through beautiful Riga, that um, uh, the most important film, Polish film of the year, EO by Jerzy Skolimowski, gathered only 20,000 admissions in, uh, in Polish cinema recently. So, uh, you know, not too many people watched the film. And it's a Polish contender, the film was awarded in Cannes. 
um, and and it's a bit sad um, at some point. And uh, when when I thought about and we're very into you know art house cinema, artistic cinema, and we're talking about artistic cinema, but uh, but what is what 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 scares me? Uh, and w when I see this problem with this westernization um, uh, uh, of of Polish cinema, uh, it's uh, it is connected with mainstream cinema, mainly, and um, there I can see the cinema as a weapon. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, if I would describe. Uh, Polish mainstream cinema nowadays, because Polish artistic cinema is very strong, recognizable, you know, um, appears uh, um, in almost every festival, uh, like in Berlinale, Cannes, uh, Venice. But Polish mainstream cinema, it's it's like um, I would call it um, the kingdom of Hollywood replicas, and uh, like uh, we have so many. Uh, bad romantic comedies, gangster <laughs> films, and it's it's like it's, it's a very Polish thing, like a gangster film, very cheap gangster film. They're so so um, uh, so popular. Then we had uh, 365 days, like uh, world phenomenon. You know, it's fir first place on Netflix. It's a film about uh, women fantasy about being raped by a uh, handsome Italian, and. You know, th this film was extremely, uh, like two million people in the cinema, then probably watched by five million people uh, on Netflix. Then Netflix invested, you know, they invest in uh, New Sorrentino, New Cuaron, but in Poland they invested in two sequels. And, um, and then there is this uh, wet dream of uh, Polish government, a uh, very right-wing conservative government, to rewrite the history um have like through film and um and they really want to you know their dream is to uh, create a film uh epic spectacular uh hollywood style film uh, directed by for example mel gibson and it's not a joke um but of course there are not enough of you know um professional filmmakers who would do it but you know there are still Many, uh, many filmmakers, uh, many films um, about Polish history, uh, martyrology, uh, and sometimes, you know, rewriting history in a bad way. You know, it's not telling how it was, but you know uh, how it was from there. Uh, you know, it's it's a matter of uh, perspective. You know, um, history as a kind of a fantasy, but not Quentin Tarantino's fantasy. But you know it's um, uh, right wing fantasy, so you know it's like then the conclusion is like the cinema uh, as can be uh, a weapon of propaganda and uh, and now uh, in our part of Europe, especially in, uh, probably in Poland, maybe also in Hungary, it's very it's very important, very dangerous. So so um, I think we here at film festivals we we uh, we often talk about. Uh, artistic cinema, and they have influence uh, on on the audience. But you know, who attends film festivals? Uh, like open-minded, intelligent, well-educated people. I think the the w the worst problem is elsewhere. Yes, thank you, Martin, for pointing out not only <laughs> to the fact that the film festival is not a place only for art. <laughs> questions or for political questions, but especially for those political or social political questions that relate to the festival and the film as a media uh, to an industry. And I think it's a perfect starting point <laughs> to move on to Aniko, who has uh, for many years uh, researched in the in exactly the connection of, of uh, this kind of cinema, not only this kind of cinema, but also that other kind of cinema in a global perspective. So maybe, Annika, if you would um, just yeah. continue, probably. Sure, sure, yeah. So t to continue, but also I'm trying to keep in mind the original question because mm -hmm. we're digging deep into it mm -hmm. and it's the discussion is, is growing as it should. So what is cinema? <laughs> What is cinema as a weapon, and what, and through our own experience, and um, 
And in, in relation to f film festivals, how do film festivals stage cinema mm -hmm. as a particular weapon or tool or mm -hmm. um, um, place for cultural diplomacy and understanding? I think we've had a range of metaphors here. So um, to just to um, uh, you know state my my point of view, I don't really have one because I haven't. I'm not a festival programmer, so I don't really represent either a festival or a country. I'm primarily an educator and a scholar, uh, which is not a neutral position, not in any way neutral. Um, and I am Hungarian, but I also have lived in the United States for a long time and in, the, in Los Angeles for 15 years, where I teach at the University of Southern California, which is boasts uh, of being the number one film school in the world. So. Most of my students are aspiring film professionals. They are very international. Many of them want to work in the industry. And USC, my institution, is kind of a, um, a background or a factory or as a, a training uh, uh, ground for, for the, but the industry, meaning of the Hollywood industry. But many of them want to, want to work in independent cinema. Um, and, and many of them have really high aspirations, political aspirations, uh, aspirations to change the language of cinema and, 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 and come up with something unique and new and distribute their work internationally. So it's a, it's a bit particular kind of place where I'm always finding myself in between, in between the region where I'm from and that I'm studying um, the commercial industry and, the I and independent cinema. I myself have programmed very small festivals just because you can't help it when you work at USC in Los Angeles. Um, and I sit on juries, but, but um, no, it, this work is not really comparable to the work that my colleagues here are doing. Um, and as an educator, I'm thinking about the history of <laughs> cinema and the, the times when history, when cinema is a weapon, cinema became a weapon, third mm -hmm. cinema. You know, those of you, who if you take a, you know, basic intro course to cinema, you will come across cinema as a weapon, a militant, uh, violent means of approximating, actually picking up a gun and expressing uh, usually an antagonistic position as it happened in Latin American cinemas um, in the 50s and 60s, uh, or the avant-garde cinemas uh, around the world. Uh, so there is a historical wave of um, of uh, taking up this new mass medium and, and using it to disrupt cinematic language and through disrupting the language itself, disrupt the ideology, the dominant ideology, the paradigms that constitute uh, what we consider normal, which are paradigms of uh, class systems and capitalism. Um, so I, I feel like that kind of cinema, that kind of truly militant cinema that openly professed to use cinema as a weapon, the cinematic language as a weapon of disruption, it maybe is not so much with us anymore. Cinema is much more dispersed. There are many more festivals, um, and, and especially in, a, in large cities like Los Angeles, uh, where the dominant cinema is omnipresent. It doesn't need an expression, a cultural expression, dedicated to it. There are a million festivals dedicated to much more fragmented, much more local cultural expressions and identities. Ethnic festivals, identity politics festivals, LGBTQ, diasporic festivals, um, for whom cinema is not so much a weapon, but a way of belonging. Uh, but there is also, there, there are always multiple underlying political causes. Maybe shore up a diasporic identity, which can be which can be progressive, it can be quite regressive, can be ethnocentric, tribal. Uh, it can uh, mobilize around a, a current political cause, such as the cause of Ukraine. So you would see lots of screenings and festivals around um, Ukraine um, and the aggression against Ukraine these days. Not just in Los Angeles, but that's my experience. So, so what I'm trying to say is, that cinema as a weapon maybe is a somewhat outdated concept in our neoliberal present. Um, however, cinema is still very much political. It just functions in a much more dispersed, uh, uh, maybe even individualized fashion uh, to cater to smaller groups. And these smaller groups can be nations, but they can be subnational formations. 
I, I, I just want to say I agree. This, this is one of the things that I think has even happened over the past. You know, you look at the explosion of film festivals, even in the world that exist, and we sort of talked about the audiences. That, that there has been a fragmentation. One of the things we talk about cinema as a weapon and an art, and I think it was alluded to already, is that for, for one thing, I work, this is just an aside, but it, it sort of links into what I'm saying. You know, I work with short film is one of my main things that I do. And short film is a very different, in some ways, medium to feature film through its industrial context and how it is worked and how it is put together. And I think, in making general terms, short film can be a lot more political than feature films. These are very general ideas. But I also know that when you are putting stuff on and talking to audiences and thinking about your audiences, there's always something in the back of your mind which goes, I think, you know, this is for my audience. And But the one thing is that you're thinking, I know I'm probably preaching to the converted. How, how if you want to tell people about these stories and these things, you want to bring people in, you want to bring the people in you know who you know will come and respond to these films, but what you really want are people who don't know these films. Yeah. You want people to experience something new. Because as you mentioned, in Estonia, in many countries, I don't think we need to get into a debate about the bad or goodness of Marvel or whatever it is, but the whole point is they are so overwhelming and so overpowering, that's what people know. It's about how do you get people to experience something else that is beyond an audience that you often have already. And that is, is still a difficult question to answer. Yes, I think every film festival is struggling a lot with this audience building, uh, f which is a process of imagination and uh, and pragmatical uh, frames at the same time. I, w I was thinking like a very uh, direct association that I had when when you said about this vanishing kind of uh, I, uh, the, the the myth of the of cinema as a weapon is kind of vanishing a little bit, and given the trajectory of cinema from this media or outstanding art that uh, struggled a lot to become considered an art within <laughs> the uh, uh, um, or a part of culture and not just entertainment this was the beginnings of cinema uh, until it became like uh, the center of entertainment industry I was thinking that there is also maybe we should mention that there is some kind of uh, uh, blind spot on today's panel because yesterday's panel uh, there were two Ukrainian um, here, and today they are not. And I'm very sure that um, because they already have left for Kiev to program their the Kiev Critics Week, but I'm very sure that their answers would be somehow slightly different um, for the Ukrainian film industry. War and f weapon has become a very different notion, mm. and uh, I was writing couple of articles lately about this question, <laughs> which is actually a very early question in, in cinema history, because I worked a lot on Ziga Vertov, who is mm. probably the first to also theoretically uh, um, say that uh, cinema can be a strong weapon. Um, but at the same time, for contemporary Ukraine film industry, for example, uh, the crucial question is, uh, like Oleg Sentsov, uh, like uh, main producer of the country, uh, country Vladimir Yatsenko, uh, husband of Irina Tsilik, uh, Artem Chekh, and you can name them and name them. Uh, they have decided to join the army to uh, f fight in the resistant movement against uh, this Russian aggression war. Uh, they are in between the fields and I think uh, it gives a much more uh, probably um, refined even, refined uh, and more concrete uh, uh, experience of what the cinema should look like, which you parallel <laughs> work to, to your work on, on the battlefield. So it's uh, uh, not just absurd or surreal for most of us, but uh, very tragic and very concrete uh, in their case. Um, so when, when I spoke with Dari Badior, who was yesterday's moderator, um, I think two things became very uh, obvious. One is that, uh, at least from my point of view, as this Austrian-German, somehow neutral, but of course Western uh, uh, located uh, observer, then participant of this film industry, um, I was conceiving the question of colonialization or hegemonial cultural structures or Westernization, of course, as a West-East problem. So for 30 years, 
and I, I think still given the given yesterday's discussion I had the feeling that especially for the Baltic countries this is still a very very ominous uh, problem uh, but then at least for the last 10 15 years and for many people from Eastern Europe also for 30 years <laughs> there is the second uh, colonial aspect which is the Russian imperial colonial uh, uh, problem so um, I wanted to, because we have this headline, Westernization and Eastern European cinema, and we automatically link it to colonialism or capitalism or modernization, in your case, yes, in your talk, and merchandization. Um, can you comment on this? How accurate is this term Westernization? Does it still play the same role, or did it change with this interference of uh, this other colonial uh, aspect? Sorry, it's a difficult question, and I didn't prepare you for it, but it really <laughs> came across <laughs> the, my mind that it's very important. So y are you asking about the terminology? Which one is? No, maybe mm. also the not just the terminology. Of course, I mean, it's important mm. to, 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 I think, mean or to know what you mean when you say it, yeah. uh, but also as a, as a problem. Uh, you can start, yeah, maybe, Martin, I and then... So, so, like... Yeah, as you, as you said, there, there are a few different perspectives. I mean, like, first, I, I, I was telling about, you know, um, Eastern European cinema and this Hollywood uh, legendary mm -hmm. myth. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Then, uh, how, to, um, how to reach, uh, how to break the wall uh, with um, how to reach Western audiences with, you know, Polish, Latvian, Czech, uh, Hungarian films. Uh, you know, it's uh, the most important film festivals. There are Italy, Germany, France. Then it's uh, uh, sales agents. So the most important sales agent companies are based in, again, um, uh, Germany, France. So, um, and it's, you know, it's like finding a key you know, uh, and uh, we're always like, you know, it's this, it's this, um, when I spoke to people in the Polish industry, they are dreaming of, uh, you know, first they want to put their films in, you know, Cannes Film Festival or Berlin Film Festival. That's obvious. Uh, they're not thinking about small, big small festivals as, as I, del I, I call them, like New Horizons or um, Transylvania Film Festival, Indy Lisboa, Reykjavik Film Festival, Riga Film Festival. Uh, they're like uh, the most important film events in these countries um, based on art house cinema um, with, with audience orientated, not market orientated. But of course, it's like the first, the first, the first thought. I okay, I have to be in you know Cannes Film Festival. How to do it? And it's and it's extremely difficult. And I remember um, ten years ago in Poland, uh, we would dream about um, um, a Polish film s uh, being in the official selection of Cannes Film Festival. It was like. Then, and of course, at that time, Romanian cinema was, you know, like every year, every, <laughs> every fi important film festival, it was kind of a fashion in some way. Hungarian cinema also. And we were like, okay, we're, we're doing something wrong. And even Ida, you know, mm -hmm. Oscar awarded film, Ida by Paweł Pawlikowski, of course, it was like a huge success for Polish cinema. But guys, this film was rejected by Cannes and Venice. And the world premiere was in London. So it was really, you know, and probably it's a matter of uh, being highlighted by the, this Western world. Uh, and now, you know, after, after Ida, after Cold War by Pavel Pawlikowski, uh, after Corpus, Corpus Christi, you know, uh, we can see it at New Horizons, we have this, uh, um, an event called Polish Days, and we present uh, Polish films to in international sales agents, film programmers, and you we can see that it's I now it's a lot easier to uh, invite invite them to Wrocław. So okay, I will come. Okay, you know now uh, almost uh, all art house Polish films they have sales agents, so it's just easier. But probably it was uh, a coincidence that, or you know, it was like this one. Ida success, who, who, 
um, who made it possible. So, so yes, that's the second point. And then, of course, there is Russia. Maybe, maybe in po Poland was was is so anti-Russia and was anti-Russia last 30 years. So, maybe we didn't feel it. 70. Uh, <laughs> what? No, not just I mean 30. Sorry. 30. <laughs> I mean okay, after badly. you know yeah. mm, 30 something. Yeah. Um, but of course, early also. But I mean, like it's uh, the, the last period, uh, and. You know, at, in Poland, there is uh, not a single film festival even thought about showing a Russian film this year. But, uh, but of course, there is this problem because other festivals, um, also you know, bigger festivals like Cannes, you know, with uh, with having Kirill Serebrennikov's film, uh, and the main competition um, on the first day of the festival with five screenings. You know, it's uh, it was like a kind of a paradox because Kelly Reichardt film uh, had two screenings at the festival and one very far. You know, you had to take a bus to go there. Um, and and Kirill Sebrenikov of the festival. and uh, which one? Uh, Kelly Reichardt uh, Reichardt's film showing up, and and Kirill Sebrenikov's film uh, was uh, had five screenings, two first days of of the festival, uh, and of course there were uh, some Ukrainian films. Uh, and, uh, there was pump fear and there, there was, was pump butterfly, and vision. butterfly visions. Yeah, uh, butterfly vision uh, in Ensemble Regard and pump fear in Cancer de Realisateur. Uh, but you know, let's face it, these are sidebars. I mean, like Ensemble Regard is the official selection, but you know, let's face it, you know, it's not the main competition. Um, again, then Switzerland, Locarno, the main competition, Sokurov. Uh, and even you know at smaller festivals, you know it's 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 um, further you go, uh, it's easier to be n neutral. Like uh, I was in a beautiful place in Portugal, and I was a jury member, and then the same case, like a film, a Russian film in a competition, and I I, I told the, I, I asked the programmers why is that, and they told me no, you know because there is a. Uh, Russian programmer working for the festival, and you know we didn't want to um, make her sad. And oh, that's not an explanation. <laughs> <laughs> that's not an explanation, guys. It's it's. So, um, so you know, it's again, it's like uh, different parts of Europe or the world, different perspectives, and probably it's you know it's we should change like the mechanisms. Um, uh, like uh, I, uh, you know, uh, when we, uh, as distributors, we go to Berlin to Cannes to on the most important film markets. Um, there is a bunch of distributors, like uh, my friends from uh, Hungary, from from Czechia, from from Lithuania, also, and we talk about films. You know, what did you buy? Sometimes you buy films together, and you know, uh, and I I talked uh, regularly with uh, with with my Lithuanian friends, and they told me. You know, it's not so easy to buy a film uh, from you know the, the the major sales agents like Asian and European ones, uh, only for uh, Lithuania or for the Baltics, because they uh, they usually um, sell the film to R Russia, Russian distributor, so um, like uh, for uh, ex-Soviet uh, areas regi regions, uh, and then you can rebuy it. Because it's easier for them. It's sim just simpler. Uh, okay. Oh, a lot of paperwork, you know, and, and you know what we free deals uh, with, or f uh, a deal with uh, separate deals with Georgia, with Russia, with Moldova, with oh my God, so many, so much work. So I think this all mechanism should change, you know, um, uh, and 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 uh, I really was uh, was disappointed by 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 this. Um, uh, by these uh, decisions of uh, the most influential film festivals, sales agents also, because um, not too much changed, to be honest. Um, yeah, so, so basically that's it. If you want to pick on that, I want to ask, uh, do you, why is it? Do you consider it naivety or uh, yesterday there was this term laziness uh, or you don't want to be disturbed in your inner rituals? You don't want to be 
reflecting on the cynicism of the industry, what, how do you explain it, or what did you want to add to this I, uh, it's I just wanted to expand upon the sort of something that was alluded to, and it was just, again, this is just a personal sort of observation, and again, about westernization. And again, I really want to stress this is a personal observation from me being an outsider living in Estonia. Those of you who know Estonia, you know, comparatively small country, popula you know, population of 1.3 million people, and as such, I think Creative Europe and media used to describe it as a country of low audiovisual outputs. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I think is the uh, is the term that is used. But it, it was interesting how I saw there seemed to be a, what I maybe term a slight sort of cultural insecurity that sometimes the national cinema would be more validated if it was accepted outside of the country. A film would be more important if, and it wasn't just, you know, within that you have the ideas of the festivals and the importance of festivals and the festival structures within that, but something would become more important just by very virtue of its screening somewhere else, getting a distribution deal somewhere else, not on the quality or what people have thought of the film, just by the very fact that it has gone somewhere else has made it more valuable in people's eyes. Um, you know, even... Uh, I remember when Tangerines, the uh, Estonian Georgian co-production, was nominated for an Oscar a few years ago. A UK film gets nominated for an Oscar, uh, a German or French film, well, that's just another day in the film world. You know, this was news. Estonian film with Estonian actors are, you know, it's in the final five. It's actually been nominated for an Oscar. This was huge news, and suddenly it, it meant something by that, not the quality of the film, not just what the film is and of itself as a piece of work. The fact that somehow, by going somewhere else, by screening at another film festival, validates it more. Yeah. And that is not necessarily dangerous, but it's interesting to see those reactions, how, again, this sort of slight cultural insecurity, as I call it, again, personal opinion with, with, with how, I, how I saw it. I wonder if uh, by westernization, what we really mean here is um, turning towards Western Europe, so Western Europeanization, because, I mean, what do we mean by the West here? Maybe, maybe inc we include the Toronto Film Festival, but otherwise, I mean, there is a Euro, uh, Western Europe, North America angle, but mostly the, what defines the status and the, the self-worth of East European film festivals and filmmakers and national cinemas is how they're validated on the West European stage at Cannes, at uh, uh, Venice, at Berlin. That's it. That's pretty much it. It's not Carlo Vivari. Carlo Vivari had to take a back seat when it was established. It's one of the oldest ones, right, in Eastern Europe. Because Moscow <laughs> came into the picture and established a festival, and then the, uh, the International Festival Committee decided that Carlo Vivari should go by annual. So every other, to, to give room to the Cold War superpower rival. So it's, it's, this, it's this historical uh, lag, this, I don't know, backwardness, it, it's insecurity, that these festivals are still tr trying to overcome 20 years, 30 years after the but Cold War, yeah, right? I, I just Yeah. And I think that is the case where the uh, idea and the structure around it is another example of uh, something big without a content. Uh, but of course, there was a content in it. But all in all, it was uh, just a, you know a paper bag, um, a paper bag. Uh, Idea, actually. Let's wait with the audience questions yeah, for no, you. Sorry, no, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> it, it I don't. I don't. I'm not the moderator. It's so fine. Sorry. I mean, it's yeah, fine. Yeah, no, there was a comment more. I understood uh, also. Just a comment, yeah. Okay. Because, but and but it is. Uh, it's also as mentioned because as you yeah. just mentioned, it is not Thank just you know the Western Europe thing. Yeah. It is the structures. It is these ideas about what an A-list festival is, <laughs> what that kind of thing is how those sort of things work. And again, within that, then, how does that validate a film more than another festival? There is also 
those structures within the f film festival circuit. And of course, let's not forget that we've, we've alluded to it slightly, that for a lot of these festivals, there is a huge industrial complex and business complex. It's not just about getting audiences to see films. It is about Absolutely. the making of said films, which is actually a huge and important part of it, and also maybe a huge and important part, as you mentioned, you know, the sales agents, they come from Germany, and they come from France, and they come from Italy, and all that kind of stuff, that again has a huge effect, not only on what people see, not only what people talk about, but actually what gets made as well. Of course. Yes. Mattis wanted to say. Yes, because Mattis is uh, probably the one who can answer <laughs> the question. <laughs> Do well, you yeah, adapt I mean to <coughs> this, or how do you uh, react? So, first of all, about the validation system that's in place in these smaller countries where films get more attention as they get recognized in, you know, big European festivals. It's absolutely true. And on one hand, you can look at it as a kind of sign of provincialism. But on the other hand, uh, what these people don't realize is that it's not only about the quality of the work, it's right. also about the relationship with this huge system that deals with star power, that deals with sales and business, that deals with uh, quotas that some of the film festivals have for specific regions mm -hmm. that they have set. Oh, this is a specific region for some reason, that, and from this region mm -hmm. we're going to take two or three films. Mm -hmm. It's all this kind of stuff that is behind a film getting into an A-list festival or a, or a good festival or any kind of this kind of yeah. validation process. So it's, uh, it's, it's a complicated endeavor that has a, a range of mul multiplicities connected to it. Um, and also from the perspective of production. So in terms of how films are made in, in Europe, um, they're mostly funded by public funding bodies and a lot of films uh, that are mid to high budget are films that are European co-productions. And when we look at European co-production structure, it's also interesting how usually these smaller countries, such as Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, they're usually the small co-producers to big French, Italian, German, Austrian, whatever films. And right now, there is a certain tendency, at least in, in, in these smaller countries, to, to, to think about how we can turn this around. And it's very difficult uh, for, for a number of reasons, the main of which is the difference in salaries uh, across these geographical regions and, and across these different countries, but also in terms of the kind of power that comes with the French producer or the Italian producer, because they have the contacts and the links to all these distribution platforms, to these festivals. There's even a joke going on around in, in the Latvian film industry that if you want even to have a shot at your film getting into Cannes, you need to get a French co-producer because otherwise it's impossible. So it's, it's, this is the kind of signs of, of, of colonialism that I've seen in terms of the production landscape. Yeah. And there is truth in every joke. Let's yeah. add that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's not a, it wasn't a joke. It, <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm <laughs> saying. <laughs> that is what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it was, I mean, ju just as an aside, but it was interesting how sometimes films from certain places are privileged over the other. Now, it might have changed over the past few years, but I know, you know, a few years ago, there used to be media and creative Europe money. And it used to be that, you know, to get that money, you have to show X amount of European film. But it also used to be that some countries, the ones of low audiovisual output, would be privileged over countries like Germany and France, that if you picked, it may have changed, but it's interesting how, and I don't know whether people would see that as a positive or negative, by saying that those countries that produce less film would mean more to your media quota <laughs> to try and convince. So, so people would just collaborate with these smaller countries to like tick a checkbox on their media uh, thing. Uh, <laughs> but in the sense of, like I say, that if you take and again, I'm, it, it was a long time ago, so the, the actual specifics are gone from me. But, you know, it's the idea that if you take a show a film from, say, Estonia in your program, mm -hmm. it's worth two rather than somewhere like Germany that is, has a high, you know, audiovisual output is worth one. Again, I'm putting it very simplistically because I'm not the person who deals with the mm -hmm. funding. But, and again, but, but there would be arguments, I think, back and forth. Is that a good thing? Because it forces people to perhaps look at countries that they might not usually look at? Or is it a bad thing for sort of making it a tick box exercise rather than a... But, uh, but then, um, Matis, how do you deal with it? Uh, are you adapting? Are you um, work, uh, working on, I don't know, what kind of strategies from anarchy to, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, to, to counter um. these? So I have 
two projects that I, I've worked on that have done the opposite, that are Latvian majority films with larger countries as the minority co-producers. And it's not an easy scheme to pull off because uh, in terms of the budget, first of all, but also in terms of all kinds of rights and agreements because it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to do it. But right now we're trying to do it with an animated film where we have Latvia as the main production country and then there's France and Germany involved as the minority production countries. And right now we've done most of the work, but in terms of the shares, it's going to be pretty equal. So it's also this kind of discussion. I mean, you have, you're maybe bringing more money to the table, but you can do less work with that money because of this dis disproportion in terms of salaries. So it's always a question of, of how we can retain the rights to these films in the end and the majority rights to these films. Uh, whilst still, uh, you know, reversing this, uh, I don't know, you can call it hegemonical structure where it's usually the, the, the large European country that is the main pr produ producer. Maybe Aniko. Uh, because, uh, I mean, your lecture was is so much related. Yeah. I think <laughs> the, the content firm. of your lecture is so yeah. much related to, yeah. to what is being said. Uh, and you pointed out on this example of The Witcher, which yeah. has a trajectory from a Polish, not very known uh, film to the Netflix uh, hype. Sure. Yeah, that's going through my mind, and I don't want to take the d discussion elsewhere. I work mostly on uh, television these days. Uh, of course, it's inseparable from cinema or living in a transmedia environment. Uh, however, uh, in, uh, in terms of television, you know, the 1980s were the time of, of media imperialism, the wall-to-wall -wall Dallas. Perhaps some of you still remember this European fear of being swallowed up by uh, American products and the national cultures and histories being stifled, uh, which didn't come to pass. In fact, what's happening uh, now is, uh, you know, the there are f smaller production centers, cities and nations such as South Korea, such as Israel, uh, the Nordic countries, uh, that have become very, very significant producers, often with uh, in, in collaboration with the, the platforms, the uh, subscription video on demand platforms, um, and public media, pu public broadcasters. So uh, it's a much more dispersed environment, although we people still talk about platform imperialism. So that's that, a kind of multipolar world of, of media production and distribution, arguably. That's probably not, n not, not what's happening in the world of festivals, though. <laughs> it seems like the two worlds, maybe there is a bit of a distance between them. Uh, there is, there's probably some overlap, but the festivals are for a different purpose. They have a different cultural mission. They carry different kinds of content. And the content is bound up with national identities. And so uh, it's, it's inconceivable to think about maybe a, a Latvian uh, production to team up with a South Korean company or a Chinese company, even though financially it might be more feasible, the film would get more uh, attention. But but this this kind of European circulate it's it's the festival world is still seems to be uh, bound to this European circulation of value <laughs> in the first place, especially East European. I mean, of course, the European Union is is the context for this. It's very hard to step out of it. So I think so. Westernization still very much. In, um, applies and I think uh, Western Europeanization, whereas the, the South Asian and East Asian, mo mostly East Asian and Latin American uh, festivals are looking towards North America. And so there's that division, two kinds of Westernization perhaps. One is Hollywood centered, the other one is more centered around Cannes, although Cannes is also the center of everything. So yeah, it's, uh, these, those are th that's kind of the structure I'm seeing, but mm -hmm. Mm. Maybe others see it differently. Martin, what is your? Uh, I don't know. I'm not asking about strategies, <laughs> but maybe more more about the the observation of uh, 
uh, of of uh, because I I I would actually not so much agree with the idea that the festival life is apart from it. I mean, uh, curating the festival or being progr pro programmer of these festivals is it means a lot to understand. I mean, th it's the biggest decision at the moment to take Netflix productions or not, for yeah. example. Sure, sure. Uh, many, as far as I know, many selection teams do have uh, people in their team who mm. come from platform uh, uh, experience, sure. uh, th which has also a big variety from maybe, I don't know, movie to uh, not as selective uh, to the really like <sighs> mainstream entertainment industry. So. I think for the for the festival it's a big a big question and uh, and also because of the audience again we have touched this uh, problem in the beginning where it was more about uh, imagining audiences but uh, here we have a real question of how to capture the audience uh, especially a younger generation who looks at this uh, I don't even know how to call cinema you know is it a medium <laughs> is it a is it an entertainment industry is it a, is it a language is it mm -hmm. uh, it becomes a crucial <laughs> aspect and uh, and you make compromises I think from my experience <laughs> now working for a bigger festival it is a lot more about making compromises than working for a small festival where you can actually still work as a curator mm -hmm. <laughs> looking at the specific film looking at the even maybe the biography of the filmmaker something completely <laughs> utopian in the things that you described here which is so much about understanding the logics and strategies of the industry and adapting to it or battling against it from from still an economic point of view if i may sure. just it it's sort of but but links in what we were talking about earlier about fragmentation and i can't not talk about online as well again that's another discussion for another time but it has to be sort of tacitly mentioned because obviously which because of that pandemic thing that happened a lot of us have started to show more stuff online and now it's become inherently bound with a lot of film festivals about showing stuff online within our countries which hopefully brings that out to a bigger audience but then it goes back to the question earlier on of are we reaching the audience because it's great that you can reach everybody potentially but just because you can doesn't mean they're going to go for it I remember 10 15 years ago 20 years ago doing short film you know online was going to be the great democratization of art and cinema everybody would get a chance to experience new things but you know 10 15 years ago if you looked at the most watched short films online they were the Star Wars parodies I'm not going to say anything bad about Star Wars I like Star Wars but people were going for what they know and it goes back to that thing of when you have those things available and whether it's through TV and online and Netflix and all these kind of things how do you also get people to experience something new and something different because people will go for what they know and what you know the thing again it goes back to that idea of how are we growing audiences in such a fragmented world to try and get them to experience something new if you take that as a, a utopian ideal of film festivals yeah. to to, sh to show that towards people yeah i mean uh, i think accessibility is not the problem at all it's the yeah. other way around it should it's be overproduction the it's overproduction yeah. and the Over, highlighting yeah. and the attention economy yeah. basically right that that uh, we are focusing uh, so in this in this job of uh, raising attention to the the specific maybe not necessarily always new because i also think that this innovation uh, uh, idea is also part of uh, <laughs> our modernization <laughs> of some logics that don't necessarily uh, appeal appear to be even uh, a fact because if you look at many films uh, in in these big selections it's actually the very traditional and very mainstream art house <laughs> idea that is being reproduced and reproduced all over the place so um, how from your point of view, do you contribute to this uh, uh, highlighting or uh, t uh, trying to get attention to 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 make it make it not just look special, but also to make it special as a I don't know maybe also a filmmaker, not just a producer, Matis, and mm -hmm. uh, for you, Martin, also. Um, 
I don't know what you mean by make, trying to make it special, but there is a, you know, in terms of Eastern European cinema, uh, sometimes there is a certain expectation as to what that entails, which has been created through these patterns that you were talking about. Oh, an Eastern European film, it must have some poor kid in bad circumstances trying to, you know, that kind of stuff that I'm talking about, these stereotypes that do yeah. come up. And that creates a pattern by then which we begin to judge these films and these stories. And you can have, uh, but of course that's not true. That's not the, the, the entirety of Eastern European cinema or Latvian cinema or Estonian cinema. And then I think it's our job uh, to make it clear that uh, there's much diversity within these labels and it's not just the first th three things that come to mind. And so f in one sense, a brand like Romanian, you know, new wave cinema is good because it attracts attention to a cinema that might have been underlooked before or, or some new tendencies. But on the other hand, it, it becomes a brand and it becomes this staple. Maybe there are some great Romanian films that come out during this time frame that do not apply these, you know, formal or, or uh, or, uh, or story tropes, but are also worth mentioning, but they just don't fit into the brand. So we have to take a look at how this, you know, branding works as well. Um, I, I would go back to your question about getting new audiences and young audiences uh, in specific. Uh, because our festival, New Horizons Festival, it's, it's a festival of young people. Uh, average age uh, ad, uh, of our viewers is 31. So it's really, it's really, um, um, uh, it's it's really a um, low number. And uh, last two years at the festival, we can see a new wave of really young people. Uh, young, I mean, like from 18 to 22, 23, mainly students, Wrocław is an university city, but we have people from whole Poland. And first, we need <coughs> to understand because you know there is this uh, uh, stereotype that. Uh, um, probably a mistake that we think um, that there are two planets. On one planet, um, there li live uh, viewers who watch only, you know, Netflix and other platform uh, uh, streaming platforms, and then there is the, the other planet uh, with people who watch uh, um, art house cinema, and it. Two different planets, and that's not true. There is only one planet. You know, we, from 2017, uh, every year we have a very detailed service uh, w because we want to know um, uh, something more about our our viewers. Um, what should be um, correct in festival organization? Uh, what do they think about festival program? But also, how they get the information about the festival, and. Five years ago, we uh, we discovered that they um, they you know 2017 so it was five years ago uh, they get the information about the festival from the internet and from friends. Ninety percent of viewers uh, said that, and it was like thousand people um, try. So you know it's it's a matter of communication. It's uh, it's it's a m you have to learn how to how to reach them, especially in this chaotic, chaotic uh, world uh, of overproduction. Uh, there are so many things they can they can do, um, but they watch Netflix and they watch uh, art house films. And why they watch Netflix? Because Netflix can communicate with them. You know, it's uh, it's how they. Um, how they write about films, about series, and social media, and this is our, you know, this is the challenge. Uh, we show pretty serious stuff, you know, pretty serious films, um, and we have to learn that we can be uh, our, you know, um, our language we use can be lighter, can be more entertaining, and it's nothing bad. Because you know we, we have to be really edgy, we have to be really uh, funny, you have to be really smart to reach them, but you have to try and you have to uh, give up your routine. You have to give up all old-fashioned medias like the internet. People are there, 
people are uh, you know with their noses in their smartphones and you have to you have to accept you have to accept it and then you have to go back to work and completely change your uh, your way of promotion and communication and we did it that's why now we see that it's um, uh, this change because we had this problem problem like six seven years ago that our audience were uh, getting older and older and it's a problem of many film festivals so uh, so that basically it it's it's mm -hmm. you know it's uh, how to communicate it's it's I think it's uh, extremely extremely important but it's um, it's a challenge I must admit I mean, there is also the, the opposite, because, uh, because for example, we're working a little bit with Rotterdam, uh, who have accepted that the audience gets older, but also what we call... You can't accept it. Uh, you can't accept, accept it, you cannot. You yeah, you I'm you saying can't. Uh, they, they have to accept it. a little bit about it, because they're also thinking of, the, of this notion of cinema versus new media cinema. And so the f the what used to be the maybe I don't know, with the concept, connected with the concept of the genius or the auteur or the big names, because we started with those, um, the status symbols of our uh, film history canon, let's say. Uh, the, this uh, hardcore filmmaker, they also become older <laughs> yeah. and many of them are dying. I mean, this being said in the year of Godard's uh, death. Uh, so they have another focus, uh, not just with the edgy, uh, part uh, in the experimental and, and young, of course, competition section, but another focus on that uh, uh, 90 plus or 80 plus filmmakers, w which is related, of course, with the canon and with film history. And this is, I would point out, also something that is now in the very back uh, of our, dis not just our discussion, but uh, the reality of, of film, but still it is there. And it would be a major, I think, task for all of us to within the frames of academic or other possibilities of having a more broader in the sense of time and history <laughs> and making connections uh, because it is not just it was an empty s space I, I, the other way around if you go through the history of eastern european cinema you will find 1000 of connections to the, to the contemporary cinema you don't have to start from a scratch and to relate only to the co-productions of today. So, so in these history books, there should still be the films that do not get recognized <laughs> at this uh, certain contemporary point. Um, but what I wanted to um, maybe ask uh, as, a, as a last big question and then open up the discussion to the audience and to you is, um, does that also mean, because do critics uh, or journalists still play some kind of role uh, for this process? And if yes, does it also necessarily mean that uh, they have to get younger or more adapted to, to the new um, frame? Can I, can I say something sure, sure. real quick? Um, which might lead, lead back to it, but I'm yep. thinking about uh, Marcin's comments. Mm -hmm. uh, when you said uh, young people watch either Netflix or mm -hmm. movies, good movies, <laughs> art cinema. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, Netflix has a lot of good movies. I mean, of course, yeah, yeah. very sophisticated, uh, what we call art house cinema. But maybe that's just my catalog because th that's the recommendation. That's what the recommendation algorithm, you uh, know. Switch on Polish films, so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you'll yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not Polish series. But, but if but it's, Polish but so Netflix is just a platform, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it, cu it curates for us, but co-curates with us. And this is, is this kind of I I implies the role of the mm -hmm. critics. What, mm -hmm. what is the role of the critic when I'm the critic? Mm -hmm. And I, I give uh, Netflix ideas as to, b based on my viewing habits. Um, but it's not just Netflix, it's HBO. Yeah. HBO Max has a lot of movies. It started out as a movie channel. Um, as you know, e basically every of production course. company or broadcast channel now has an online platform. Yeah. So it's, it's part of the environment. And what I think what the kids, my students, <laughs> Watch his YouTube. It's you know, it's ne Netflix is al already for old people. My my <laughs> students, <laughs> my students associate Netflix with watching TV. But uh, yeah, I, of course, uh, you I know? For, for me, Netflix is not something bad. But we shouldn't uh, consider Netflix as you know this enemy. No, right, right, right. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's it's that it's was like in uh, itself. In itself, it masquerades as something yeah. neutral. It can you can pick whatever you want. We're just helping you. 
at the same time, I wonder if Netflix is the new imperialist. I mean, that's the idea but of platform but imperialism. But, but again, it's also an <laughs> important thing to note about Netflix that, for example, Estonian Netflix is very different from that's the UK I, Netflix, right. which also has an effect because, again, there yes. is an idea that if there's only a quarter available yeah. on Estonian Netflix, you're going back into that curation and thing because yeah. they are actively denying... If you're in the UK and in the, the west of Europe, you can go to Germany and France, you can get a lot more on Netflix, have access exactly. to a lot more thing exactly. than you can in, say, Estonia. And that actually is, has an effect as well, because you're basically yeah. telling people, here in this country, you are only allowed to see a quarter of the content, because mm. whatever, and you're paying probably the same money, but you're only allowed a quarter of the content because... Because, because we don't know the principles, you know, and they might well be coloured by the very same stereotypes. Uh, that you mentioned, Matt, is, uh, is a, small, a, s a small selection for a small country. We <laughs> cannot decide what you guys want <laughs> over there because we've never actually met and, and you And if guys. you go back to the <laughs> idea of people using that and, in, and you know, we consuming culture that way it's and, and actively denying them some culture. And Netflix is just a placeholder because Netflix is actually shrinking and becoming more like a legacy yeah. player. Yeah. But yeah. There are, there are yeah. th that's the pattern. Yeah. That's yeah. what we're moving towards. It's this kind of inscrutable, kind of evil <laughs> <laughs> imperialism that we think is our friend or, or politically neutral. Yes, that's actually <laughs> it's not <laughs> questions. And um, now I will use the microphone. <laughs> but use it this way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I didn't. Uh, you have multiple. Two of them. Right. Yes. Uh, thank you for the. Did you check? Is it on the microphone? Well, it has a switch. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> oh, so this part is orange, and this part is orange. So huh. we need the same. We're in the same field of orangeness. Probably, I don't know. It's well, okay. I think it's us. on. Orange is in black. <laughs> <laughs> As I think uh, when the microphone is. Doesn't matter. Maybe yeah. just. <laughs> we can oh, hear you. you. Can hear us. Yeah. Um, actually, the the word. Uh, that was mentioned about selection uh, and what was mentioned uh, more uh, politically here um, he mentioned uh, the um, circumstances about that the Cold War wasn't accepted uh, uh, either either, either uh, yeah, sorry, uh, or, or at any other particular films weren't accepted in uh, certain um, <coughs> arrangements. So, so um, thinking about the, 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 the thing about the, the, the European um, festival industry, so I, I wanted to ask you whether there is some, some sort of uh, Should we collect a couple questions, maybe? Yes, or if no one has a direct answer, we can collect questions. Maybe three at a time. Or you have the microphone. There is one, uh, two <laughs> rows behind you. Hello? No? Okay, we'll just keep going. Uh, hello, Carl Hubrick, um, producer of the project. Uh, the War Behind Closed Doors, Ukrainian docudrama. Um, as somebody that was a suit uh, from the technology industry and potentially part of your problem right now, um, I wouldn't mind getting a reaction from some of the panelist members with regard to considering that there is a very large industrial complex behind everything that is going on mm -hmm. um, and to consider 
without having to be more coin operated, but to consider that, that you can have an idea of how the and where the industry goes. So if we look at the US, while it turns out and it's overproduced, uh, there's no overproduction there, the reality is, is that you can write off any investment practically. The European Commission has changed and moved forward and updated the Creative Europe program so that there is an equivalence now in funding. But my, um, to frame that, um, my question is, is, you know, are you also considering, you know, are you considering that there's fundamentals here and maybe, you know, we need to step up with lobbying, we need to actually put our, our, our business hat on and start addressing this rather than from an artistic perspective, but from a more aggressive commercial perspective? I wanted to cool just pills. address uh -huh. the, the first question uh -huh. uh, for a start uh -huh. off about at least uh -huh. from from what I see about and again a sort of personal opinion how in general programming and people how they react to films and things like that I don't believe there's there's a curtain towards the Baltics or Poland or there's a certain exoticness to them yeah. sometimes for and festivals and these stereotypes you, you and, and those I and those stereotypes yeah. are actually very important uh, and can you know not help films because again it becomes there's a certain type of film from Estonia there's a certain type of film from Latvia there's a certain type of from whatever country um, but there is usually even if it's just a personal desire you want to tell stories and you know I do a short film program I don't I get hundreds of films from France and the UK. I don't, and they're, they are all very good, a lot of them. I don't want to show films from all France and the UK. I want to find places to, from other things that are underrepresented. That is hopefully a job of a good film festival that yep. they look at various, b and you do fall, I do think people fall into traps. That they, uh, in what trap? That you start to, you exoticize it too much or you start to think you know this is a certain country I should focus on now or I should do this and that and it starts to again uh, as we talked about the sort of stereotype of a country that suddenly there is a wave there and suddenly you start to go but, but there is a possibility that you just uh, see uh, in your huge variety of, of, uh, of um, film examples that you just saw, oh, okay, well, that was interesting. Oh, Latvia, or uh, Estonia, oh, or Lithuania, or I don't know, any other country, like from these, you know, other countries. <laughs> I, I, I mean, from my point of view, and again, I'm talking more from the short film perspective, yes. and, it, and again, again. It's precisely so, because and this is. Uh, cinema as well. It's, uh, but, and again, it's probably slightly utopian, but I see a film. I know probably people are going to disagree, disagree with me, but I try and watch a film. I don't yeah, think about yeah, where, where it's from. Ah, so where it's, okay. it's, it's a film. So I, I, will think, I, will, I will think about it afterwards, again, if, I've, yeah. if I look, oh, I think, oh, these are the best films. Oh, goodness gracious, they're all from the UK. Well, I want to, to mix it up. I want right. to, to do that. But it's never about, ooh, you know, I don't want a Latvian film because Latvian films aren't very good. If the film <laughs> is good, the film is good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, th th that, that's it. That's, so so that's there, w there wasn't uh, qu uh, quite a good film in your perspective. That's no, and, and again, that's my personal perspective, but I think yeah, yeah, that's... Sure. that's, yeah, th that's yeah. So, but there, we're still talking about a lot about uh, national cinema or national identity yes, of the cinema. We are in Riga, yes. uh -huh. Maybe that's not the only reason, because it is also for a festival important to have the quota or to find a balance for <laughs> for the representation. It's but this again is. It's 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 much. Look at look at the screen. Yeah. We have a certain topic. Yeah, but the exactly the the national aspect is not in the in the topic. That is what I find most <laughs> interesting no, because no. East it's it's not in the topic, but it's uh, intercepted in the topic. Yes, know. because uh, the the question is also, and that's why I pointed out that we don't have uh, Ukrainians on the panel, and maybe the question is also I don't know linked to, to your to your question. Uh, there is this uh, the new need also, not just the. Uh, like trying to catch up or adapt yourself or become uh, selectable, uh, but also now there is a new need of uh, really 
differenti <laughs> like making differentiations within this Eastern European and obviously, as I pointed out also, within this Westernization, or you pointed out also, that there is a difference between well Western Europe and, and the US. Can, can, he, can, he fini can she finish? No, 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 no sorry. Can, he, can she finish? Thank you. <laughs> but that, so, so what about this, uh, this need to, to at least comment on the idea that uh, if Riga or not, uh, there is a need of uh, finding these new, new stereo. Is it a, is it a, um, a plea for finding new stereotypes? Because in Aniko's re reaction, at least to yesterday's discussion, I found, I heard also, and I could feel with it a lot of frustration about that because it's uh, from our point of view maybe some. I mean, working <laughs> on in global cinema and on on this new chapter of transnational cinema so much for the last uh, years, this is kind of a, a step back, no? You, c you conceive it as a step back, maybe. Uh, 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 what is a step back, exactly? Th that we are, again, reconfiguring national cinema identities, much more a focus on that, whereas we have mo more or less transpassed it by focusing on yeah. transnational or international. Yeah, there is some disappointment in this. <laughs> Again, I'm trying to, you know, I can't help but historicize these things. Uh, because there was that moment after 89, especially in the 90s, when uh, in, in media studies, but also more broadly in the social sciences, the nationalism ended. The nation state was dying. The transnational was taking over. We really stepped into this really euphoric state for some euphoric, some for some, you know, sad state of globalization. And that's not exactly what's happened. What's turned out is that nationalism can be very well mobilized, you know, to serve the purposes of capitalism. I'm thinking about your question too, because I think, uh, are you thinking that we're not, we're not paying enough attention to the business that this is one big business? I'll just say this how it is. You guys are really bad lobbyists. Like, <laughs> you're really bad at it. What um, do you mean? Explain. Yeah. Take the microphone, please. I believe you're finessing. I believe you're finessing um, legitimately the artistic elements of film festivals, the presentation of content culture, dealing with transnational issues, and so on. I, I get that, but this isn't how you're going to fix the problem. I, I just don't see it. I just do not see it. The, US, the, un the Americans understand this, and they use they use their their. Um, their financial complex to achieve, their industrial complex to achieve their goals, which is westernization. If but does it mean, does it include film festivals, for example? Oh, of course, it's the whole ecosystem. But wha wha which what is ones, the problem that this is fixing? Well, it comes down to the, the films themselves, the marketing money that goes towards getting those films, the lobbying, the Emmys, the, the whole system. This whole system is rigged so that they can promote and they can get their values you know, elsewhere and so on. If you look at what we have with um, SVOD and OTT platforms, there is a unique opportunity for what I consider fantastic film opportunities. I'm the guy that used to watch the uh, Ethno channel till year four in the morning on Sundays because I could see amazing works. Um, the reality is, though, is that you know, the rules have changed slightly courtesy through three-way co-productions up to $2 million with Creative Europe. But if there's going to be, if you really want to achieve your objectives and your aims, then I would suggest that you know, a little bit more hard in lobbying and um, to think about the actual business fundamentals underlying this because when it comes to making decisions of how you want to project um, you know, culture, value and, and these nuance, you're all across that. You're all across that. I mean, I think, uh, so what I don't take is what that do, there is a good or a bad, uh, but what I take is that there are certainly different uh, situations and cultural, <laughs> um, uh, cultural traditions in, in dealing with the question. And maybe we sound like so much soft, soft power that we don't sound power to you. But which would be the, like looking at it institutionally, which would be the institution that comes at least closest to what is demanded here? Is it the sale, sales agency that... Uh, can I can I have the panelists answer? Uh, then you. The, the no, 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 no,
Uh, it's okay. Now we can come back. We have a lot have of people who have thoughts first. here. Let's have this question first and then come to your question. Who will answer? Who is I hard? I'd really like to hear what Matis has to say about fixing the problem. About <laughs> fixing the problem of, of, of the invisibility, I guess, or the, or the that, lack of the visibility yeah. uh, that comes with this lack of branding and this lack of business. Um, <laughs> we're going to continue our very bad lobbying here. Um, had to be done. Soft power you worked. Well, you know, for a, uh, for a small country like ours, it's, it, it sometimes depends on having star name directors. Like somebody finally gets discovered and then they yeah. follow that. And then you get some attention d uh, directed in, uh, uh, towards our country or something like that. That's, that's just the way it works within the system. For example, when we had a very, very powerful animated film a couple of years ago that ran all the festivals and won awards, then finally we got some more attention to, 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 to our anima animated cinema. And that trajectory kept continuing with more animated films from Latvia getting a lot of uh, attention. So that's one way it can be practically done, but it doesn't really break the system. It more so follows the system, if, if you want my opinion. Yeah? Let's just change the field. We need to change the field. If I may continue on that, um, uh, my name is Jukka Pekkalaak, so I'm from Finland, so I'm actually from Eastern Europe, even from looking from Riga. Uh, I work for Tampere Film Festival, which is a short film festival, and of course, when we are talking about cinema as usual, we are again talking about feature-length films, not the whole art of cinema, because we don't have time for everything. But uh, I also have been working to keep up and functioning an art house cinema in, in Tampere in Finland for 30, 36 years. And um, about 25 years ago, when I first uh, saw the first presentations of the future of cinema, as we are talking about it, cinema in big screens, and the digitalization of that. And uh, in my mind, I actually saw the utopia, in a way, where the, um, the role of national distributors and also sales agents would vanish a little bit away and there would be a direct connection between art house cinema and producers. And um, this has not happened. Actually, I see that when it comes to the, let's say, the hold of the power, the sales agents are having more power than before and the national and distribution system in Europe is acting as if we are still dependent on celluloid copies, which doesn't make any sense. And this technological change has not been used for the benefit of uh, the cinema or smaller countries as it should, as it could, and it maybe even in the future it can, but yes, I think it would be, uh, we should really aim for, a, at least in Europe, a common market for cinema instead of, of uh, keeping the, um, the structure that is from the time of the celluloid. And I think that this is what um, is the possibility for small countries like Finland, Baltic countries, and even bigger countries like, like Poland, which uh, produces not only great gangster films, but also great cinema in, in uh, many other ways. But then you're talking also about, um, I don't know, general political questions like state orientation versus... Yes, because the European uh, Union, which its policies, it's affecting uh, the film policies of each country. They have to follow the lead of the European Union. So the, the thing is that I think that the, um, the possibility and the chances to change things from up above, one country cannot change it. Actually, I, about 10 years ago, I was talking with people at the European Film Academy, and I was talking about cinema from the point of view of art house cinema, like this, and their struggle to, to find films for small audiences because digital distribution gives a possibility of changing the whole aspect of cinema distribution so that it wouldn't be pushing films to f people, it would be people demanding 
certain kind of films. But, uh, and di digital distribution is technically making it possible, but financially it is not. So um, I think that this is one of the, the possible ways. Mm -hmm. So at the European Film Academy, they were interested in, in having a discussion on the structures of European film distribution from the point of view of art house cinema. And then they, a few weeks later, they said that mm, there are a lot of people who don't want to talk about that. So um, mm -hmm. I rest my case. Do you want to react or come out of mm -hmm. it? No. Pass the microphone just in your row. Hi. So, one start by one observation. I think a lot of the debate has not been about the westernization of Eastern Europe, but the hardships of Eastern Europeizing the West, as you talk about hardships of breaking into festivals and stuff like that. But the more sort of question I want to put up here for you is shouldn't we just ditch the idea of Eastern Europe? Just leave it up. There's European culture, it's something that's kind of artificially created by the Cold War and we should try to run away as fast as we can and speak about European cultural sphere, about problems of European cultural sphere, and then make also a kind of opposition between what you distinguish there. There's American culture, kind of industry that's taking over the market, and you are all talking about publicly funded films that cannot compete with this over southern market, and you have to work with festivals and kind of work from that kind of perspective. Thank you. Should we, and if so, could we? How can we? Who, who are we who could ditch the, <laughs> the idea? We, as actors, when you are actors of influence. You are actors with voice. You are actors with who have opinions that matter. As you said, soft power, you have it. You, you, you always, you, you weld it. Everyone else does it. It matters in conversations. It matters, I'm from academia, I know that. Going on on these small debates, about conferences and everywhere else, you have to change these perspectives and you have to do it day for day. Mm -hmm. And it starts from us. We have extremely lot of power yeah, in the European possibly. Union. We are empowered to an uh, incredible degree compared yeah. to anywhere in history. No, but that's, that's, that's what, what actually was the intent of my question to Aniko when I said that it seemed that in theory, in academia, in rhetorics, in, in building like this kind of uh, new perspectives, we have been at a point where now we take a step back or we, it looks like the realities of the festival structure is still much more national identity or whatever quota east-west somehow label uh, re related and um, and with the war I'm sorry but really this uh, I mean it's in the focus of Ukraine I think it's uh, it becomes so obvious that uh, for some it's a non it's an anti-imperialist gesture for others it's a decolonializing gesture for the third party as yesterday's discussion clearly showed it's an non-Russian or even anti-Russian perspective. So there is this element is still alive and we cannot, I think, just ignore it. Yeah, but with an European perspective, it's hard for me to grasp the idea of how there is an East-West imperial or colonial relationships. Historically, the sort of colonial networks of trade, right? East Euro Eastern European benefited as much from them as the West. No. Yeah, they did, like Hungary. Budapest had much colonial trade going through with goods. Riga definitely is built in part of colonial trade as it was uh, intermediate between Russian Empire and... I'm sorry, I'm colonies. sorry, you're wrong. I'm <laughs> kind of not. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a historian you've got, you've working got this these subjects. And you've got this history wrong, I'm sorry. Really? I, well, what sort of... Yes, the, the, the uh, hierarchy between East and Western Europe goes back centuries. And you're, you're, you're picking out Hungary because it was one of the, it was, you know, part of the monarchy. But even within the monarchy, Austria had the, uh, was the economic center. I mean, ju I'm responding to this little slice of it because you, you p picked this I, I, out. I, 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 okay, this is going through. I'm ask any kind of early modernist or 19th century historian, they would say that there doesn't e exist this sort of, gas this category of East and West, there's a periphery and there's a center. Definitely there. There are developed parts of Europe, not developed parts of Europe. But the debate has moved way of, away from that question. But, okay, I'm yeah. but, but would yeah. you also say that uh, the term 
because I in a, agree in a certain uh, extent that uh, I think uh, each, each even European country has its own colonial history, <laughs> participation, uh, profits, but also um, being a, a, an aggressor <laughs> or being, uh, I don't know, yeah, it's a kind of nesti it's nesting orientalism. I mean, I don't, I don't know that we have to debate whether there is a center periphery. Even you seem to agree that there is a center periphery. Has but a long it's not east-west based. That's the point. It has different kind of dimensions there. Well, there, there, is, there are hierarchies. Yes, of course, there is center periphery outside of Eastern Europe. One can argue that well, I don't want to pick on countries, but <laughs> you know, the, the, the Greece or you know, there are other countries. Uh, Cyprus can be considered a periphery. Uh, it depends on where we draw the line. Um, you know, okay. so th we are not just talking about the current European Union. You know, where does Europe end? So the, I the center periphery doesn't map onto Western, Eastern Europe. Uh, if that's what you're saying, that's, tr that's true. But there is a center periphery. And uh, most of Eastern Europe, I think, is still in the on the periphery or semi-periphery. Um, but the, what you said earlier, I think this is a really important uh, question about the responsibility and the options for, you said, people like us who have power. I, I mean, I don't think I have power, but I have the luxury of transcending nationalism. So I do consider myself part of Europe, but I had to go away, leave Eastern, Eastern Europe and make a career elsewhere to 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 be in this blissful place of nowhere, this cosmopolitan no place. This is a class position, and this is an absolute luxury that most people in Eastern Europe don't have, which is why many people in Eastern Europe currently respond to the call of populism. Because they, you know, I mean, it's not nice, it's not a nice place, but they have Just many of them have nothing else one to One thing, on. people in Italy, France, Amer United States, respond to the cult populism as much as, or even more than in Eastern Europe. Again, yeah, like, yeah, there is no, it's, it's no it's disagreement. Not thing. No, like no, it's not Italy now has a but we're talking about Eastern Europe. Right now you're asking, you're, I'm just responding to your question. What, what are we going to do about it? Here you said that people in Eastern Europe, because they are outside of the sort of Western kind of world, respond <laughs> to populism. But no, people around the world respond to populism now in such a great wave and even more so in West sometimes than I do in East. So May I ask where you are from? Uh, from here, kind of, but also from institutional affiliation, but that's a different kind of subject. But, yeah. but I would also add to this uh, that there is a... I also want to get rid of the microphone. <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, we, we, we have to call it a day soon anyway, but I would like to add that uh, because there is a, it's a re there is a real necessity in making differentiations and maybe at some point stopping this uh, binary uh, uh, labeling, but I think there is also the other part, and uh, this has been only... <laughs> slightly touched but not uh, discussed about maybe this could be a, a next discussion which is i'm now reading a very prominent in at least in germany book by a, i think british author on putin's networks and what is the main argument here is that uh, what we considered westernization or capitalist structures what would always be connected with the west uh, is the major weapon <laughs> of uh, um, Soviet, but <laughs> especially post-Soviet uh, uh, um, policy, uh, including cultural uh, politics. Uh, you can call it um, appropriation <laughs> of capitalism, you can call it adaptation, but uh, it is there and it is, uh, I think, what is happening at the moment in, in, uh, in real life on the battlefield is, uh, is a result also of this, that we have been totally blind and ignoring the fact that there is a big thing within Eastern Europe <laughs> that is totally <laughs> adapting to capitalism much better and much uh, uh, more powerful than uh, this image that we, we still have, like we left <laughs> or left wing people still have of, of, a, of, a, of a capitalism that is attached to only Western structures. So thank you for your comment. And uh, yes, thank you for the attention, participation, even if we offended, <laughs> offended <laughs> some of the participants. Um, I think we did a great job and thank you to all of you. Uh, Thank you for moderating. Thank you very much, Bob.